Riding the crest of hard rock with gothic flair, Evanescence became breakout stars in 2003 with their debut album Fallen. Frontwoman Amy Lee's bold voice and personal lyrics made songs like Bring Me to Life instant classics, paving the way to two Grammy wins at the time and the record going seven times platinum. This year, the band put out their fifth studio album, The Bitter Truth, and is touring in the fall. I'm Corey Grove, senior writer for Rolling Stone. But back in 2003, I was sort of a roadie on Evanescence's first big American tour. For the Rolling Stone interview, I spoke with Amy Lee about that tour and how her approaches to songwriting and performing had changed since then. I read in our little briefing that you were on the Nintendo Fusion tour back in 2003. I was indeed. I still have this even. Oh my God. <laughs> the itinerary. I was an intern at the time at CMJ Music Magazine, and uh, I found out about this opportunity to be a roadie for Nintendo for a tour, and they told me it was your band, and I was excited about that. Oh. And my job on this tour, I quit being an intern to go on the road and uh, move around giant video game consoles. And yeah, we had that backstage that? area with all the fun games to play. And so my job essentially was to distract your fans from watching you and try and get them to <laughs> play video games instead. Yeah. And that was a very hard job to have. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so it's an interesting thing for me because that was my first and only tour. For me, that was enough for me to know that the touring life was not for me. I, I had a good time. I had a great time. Got to yeah. see the country. Uh, but it was when I knew that I wanted to be a writer and come back mm -hmm. to New York and, and focus on that. And that's cool for you. I know that this was, you know, it was part of a big year for you, obviously. That was like probably the most touring I think you ever did. And I was a part of that, Maybe, but uh, yeah. it was a, it was a kind of a launching pad almost for you too. I know it wasn't the thing, but it was, it was part of that. So yeah. it, it's an interesting thing. So, I mean, maybe just to begin with, for me, I'm curious is what are your most vivid memories of that Nintendo Fusion tour? Oh my God. Well, you know, that's the very first year we were touring. We had just had our album come out that spring and hit the road, like right before the album came out. And it, it was one of those things where over the course of that year, our show sizes went from like clubs to big outdoor arenas um and that tour was one of our first tours ever so you know we were just all a bunch of kids and all the bands that we were on tour with on that tour um we were all friends we all became friends we all really hung out together like almost every night everybody was partying i went to disney world with revis and uh <laughs> i stole terry balsamo from cold so i mean that tour was a, a big one from us just making all those friends and you know learning how fun it could be to hang out with a bunch of, of friends on tour and go go tour around and just be obnoxious, honestly, just obnoxious children. I'm sorry for whatever you saw. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 you mean, do you remember it as a happy time? Absolutely, I do. Yeah. Well, you know, that year there was internal turmoil in my own band at the time um, between me and um, my co-founder, Ben Moody. So that time was this big contrast in my life where Things were amazing on one level and things were really difficult on another level. Um, it was really a, a big time where I was away from my family um, in that three year period, you know, like kind of working up to that. And um, my brother was sick at home. He had just um, been diagnosed with uh, severe epilepsy and they were trying to figure out, you know, how to help him. And he was having brain surgery at eight years old and stuff like that. So there was a lot of drama in my life. Um, but at the same time, being with friends and being on a summer tour and um, being able to play music for these big audiences and make music and realize, wow, this could be my real career. Like I could be a musician for my, for my, for my life, for my work um, was so cool. Um, so I, I do mostly remember it as a happy time. Yeah, I do. But um, you know, it's like anything in life. It's, it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, of course. How did you feel about just going right to being the headliner, <laughs> like immediately on your first tour there? Yeah, uh, it, it was it was like what I was saying. It was it was everything was moving really fast mm -hmm. that year. Uh, a lot of big changes in life, and that can be stressful. But at the same time, you kind of just gotta ride it. You gotta ride that wave. That's the dream. That's what you want to happen. So um, it was wonderful. But you know there's there's an element of it just fake it till you make it like go out there and act like you own it and like make them believe it and then it comes true <laughs> something that struck me about that tour was uh i remember seeing you and you had a personal assistant who was a woman 
and there were no other women <laughs> the whole tour. She's my best friend. Her name's yeah. Beth Wilson, and I've played all but three shows in my entire time since she's been out with us since right before that tour without her. Um, she is such a part of this band. Um, she takes care of all of us. She does my hair and makeup. Um, mm -hmm. But we met back in Little Rock. She did my hair then, and I went on tour. I remember it was me and only guys at first. And it's not just about that, you know, like I can hang with guys. I've always had a lot of guy friends. Um, but it was just kind of a lonely, <laughs> a lonely thing for me for a few reasons. And I remember calling her and being like, hey, they're telling me we're doing well and I could afford to like have a makeup artist or something. Like, do you want to like come on tour and we'll just do this together? And we have had so many amazing adventures together. She is just one of my favorite people in my life. Yeah. And I mean, I can see that just backstage, like, uh, you know, like in the, the catering rooms and stuff like that. You obviously had a, a you had your, your, your friend there with you. You had a, you, yeah. you weren't alone and all of that. And I mean, it was a, for me, just even as a guy on the tour, it was a strange thing just being on a pirate ship with a bunch of guys, <laughs> you know. And, and, and these two weird chicks that apparently like hanging out with them. What's wrong with us? Yeah, I know. No, but yeah, I mean, it was, <laughs> was that a hard adjustment? It sounds like it was a hard adjustment that you were just kind of like, OK, I need a, I need somebody with me. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It's changed over the years. You know, yeah. again, like it's not it's not just about boys and bands. It's the whole scene. It's everybody backstage, too. Um, and and all the all the managers, all the label. People, there was just it was just all it was just me and a bunch of guys like at telling me what to do because I was you know, you. it's not just about being a woman. I That's such a hot topic right now. And I'm trying to kind of move the subject along because making it a bigger issue, I, I think at some point isn't helping. It's making it worse. But um, I honestly, a lot of it has to do with you're a baby band. You know, you're coming out for the first time. You're just starting out. You need our help. You need us older, experienced men of the industry to tell you what to do, tell you how this works, to show you what, what you're supposed to be doing right now. And to some degree, like you do need to listen and, and learn. But on the other hand, like there was a lot of like, this is people manipulating me. Some sometimes you have to learn how to discern. Like, this is just somebody telling me what they want me to do because it's good for them, because it's better for the money, because of whatever. And I need to know when I can make that call for myself and and say no to things. And learning more and more, like when to say no, was something that was really a big part of my growth and good for the band, um, and good for our future trajectory. Um, but. But yeah, it gets lonely. I definitely had a pirate ship. Yes, that is a great way to describe it. Um, if you can find a women's bathroom on a tour like that, it's a wonderful blessing because there's been like nobody in there. You're lucky if there's any toilet paper in there because nobody's ever been in there. <laughs> but really, honestly, like it, it, I have seen that element change dramatically um, over those last 18 years. There's so many more women on the scene. I think there's an awareness there and not just on stage, but behind the scenes, engineers and tour managers. And um, we've just been moving forward in that realm, which makes me feel really empowered and proud. I think it's awesome. Um, the more that the more that the more of us there are, the more of us there will be. And change is real and it's good and it's healthy. I inclusivity in general is is where we need to be headed. In, and we are. Absolutely. I was wondering what you think of Fallen now, since that was this this first thing for you. Like, like how do you, you know, how does that style sound to you now, that album? You know, do you still approach songs in the same way? Do you go back to that? Like, how do you, what do you, what do you think of that record now? I still love it. It's still a big part of me. Like we've, we've, we're always going to play those songs. Like they're, they're precious in our relationship with our fans. And to me, just as a part of, of my history and the history of the band, it's part of our roots. It's important. Um, I certainly don't hate it. I, I still love it. But it, I kind of hear it and I hear that it's a little bit simple. Like it's a little bit like we're, we're writing, learning how to write and sticking to a lot of basic rules of like, I don't know, trying to make a hit, like just knowing what you heard on the radio and going, yeah, that's where the bridge goes. And here's where this happens and kind of just following the rules a little bit more um, than than we have ever since because that's what it needed to be. It was that first album trying to make it get everybody's attention, have as many you know singles as possible and, and do what the label man wants to some degree. Um, so that after that, it was like, cool, I'm gonna do whatever I want now. And the open door was a big moment to take those other steps and do the things that other people didn't love 
And it didn't matter because it was mine and we earned the right to do what we were going to do. Um, so it's been, it's fun to, it's fun to break the rules. It's also good to know like the basic rules of, of music and structure. I hear even in my own voice, um, making safe choices, uh, with like less vibrato, less little, uh, flirtations within the melodies and things because I really was just trying to sing. I really was just like learning how to do what I do and just sing it strong and don't mess up. Um, I've, I've, I've grown out of having to think so hard about don't mess up to where I can now think about what I want to do, not what I want to not do. And I don't know if I hear this anymore, but like at the time you, your band was considered like new metal, which I don't really think you are, but right. that was how you were marketed at the time, whether you, you know, whether you liked it or not. Right. People try to fit you into these things. That's why I'm sort of curious where you came from as a songwriter. New metal was, I think something that they called a lot of hard rock music back then that wasn't like happy rock, like the kind of harder, a little heavy, a little bit darkness and the male rapping vibe thing. So the fact that that was on Bring Me to Life, instantly people heard that first single. It's like, okay, you fit into that same category as like Papa Roach and Linkin Park and Corn and whatever it is. And yeah, I didn't like that title very much, but I just don't, I don't like any title. It's hard. It's really hard to sum something that is, you know, so precious to you up in like a word of a genre because I really love blending all the genres. One of my biggest inspirations starting out was about combining really contrasting styles, bringing something from the like cinematic and classical symphonic world and marrying it to metal and hard rock and alternative music. So um, I've always liked actually the word alternative, whatever that means, because it means not typical in my head. It means something that's not exactly like anything, um, which I feel like that's, yeah, that's the descriptor. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and you and I are, I think, pretty close to the same age. So we grew up with all those same touchstones, too, of what alternative yeah. music is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I get where you're coming It was from. all about everything different. I, I was influenced by a lot of bands, the the alternative stuff, grunge, too, um, which is, I guess, sort of a subgenre of alternative rock. Whatever. You, I don't know. There's so many names and labels and boxes. But like Garbage and Bjork and Veruca Salt and the Smashing Pumpkins and Soundgarden um, to... It's the heavier stuff, of course, Pantera and that Metallica and all of that. But kind of what's cool is seeing that if you just change the instrumentation on something a little bit and twist it, it can it can be the same thing. Like I remember I was training like classical piano at the time and um, I remember I was working on some Bach piece and it was real shreddy, like diddly 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 in the right hand. I'm like, this is a guitar solo like this is from some heavy metal. This is the same. Like there are so many like similarities to be drawn almost almost more so the further out you go on both sides, the more they all kind of meet in the center. And I, I just think it's nerdy and fun to sort of draw those comparisons sometimes. You know, you talk about classical music, you talk about fusing these things. The song of yours from that era that I remember at the concerts was My Immortal that really took from classical and it had the metal side. But you also did a version of it that was strictly the, the piano. If I right. Mean. Uh, and that seemed to me like a song where you were sort of figuring out where you wanted to take what that was, you know what I mean? And, and you had this great success with it when you finally, when it was finally done. But it was interesting that you did put out different versions of it and you were kind of playing around with a different. Uh, yeah. Music. Yeah. And playing live music is always just a really awesome opportunity to show different sides of a song. The fact that we've played live so much um, with our evolved band um, from yeah. that time. Um is so cool and what's part part of what's made me continue to love Fallen um, because through live, like we can ch change anything. We can upgrade as we go. And we've had so many years with that so song that there are just parts that they're fluid. It's like, you know what? This part always sounded kind of rushed to me. Like, why don't we extend this whole moment and make it really epic and blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of like the song has a life of its own and it's always still growing. Um, being able to look at it like that just is wonderful because it can grow with you. What is it that attracts you to maybe darker or heavier or more challenging music in general? I don't know. That's a good question. I always have. There's certain things I think that all of us have just specific tastes that our ears gravitate towards. I really love low end. Um, I like to listen to my music loud. Um, I like it to fill my ear. And I, my son, Jack, um, 
I think when he was five. So back when we were out going to museums and stuff, um, we went to a science museum. He's super into science. And there was this room that was all about audio. And they showed, I thought this was so interesting. And I just, it clicked in my head. I'm like, that's what I like. Um, there was a, just this spiral. It, was, it, it has to do with like the shape of the inside of your ear and like where sound goes and what different frequencies kind of like go to different places. So it shows this, this spiral and you hit a pitch. It's like, and it's like only hitting this much of the spiral. And then it's like a mid sound and it goes like further. And then it's just, and it's filling the spiral. And that's what I want. I want my, my ears full of the vibration of sound. I want to feel it going in my ears and filling it, like just filling me. Um, so I, something about that for me occurs and exists in these big, heavy, particularly like synth bass. I remember Bjork is, I would always say that's my favorite artist of all time. I remember being really attracted to her right away her music and the sound of it drew me in partially because it was really unique and different. Her voice is just special, but also she's one of those low end if I don't know how to say that. Right. But constantly this big fat, like dark, larger than life bass that just fills my head. Um, and I am always chasing something about that. So I don't know if that's just a physical, um, thing that I'm just geared towards wanting that. Um, but as far as like the minor keys and the darkness and all that stuff, that's, I love the creepy. Like I want to be cool in my music. Like that's, I, I can be happy and, you know, skippy in life. Um, but the music is my place to be a total drama queen. So I want all of it. I want the pain. I want the fury. I remember you had your own bus and the rest of your band had uh, another bus or maybe you had things were split up in different ways. Mm. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier, there was some tension within the band and you had some stuff going on in the background of your life. And this was the beginning of this thing. How did you know that this was the life for you? Like after all that, with all the, with all the negativity and stuff like that, how did you know that this was what you wanted to do? On one hand, you don't know that. You kind of just have to live moment to moment and make the decisions that are, are right for your heart and your life. You know, so in that moment, I didn't know what I was going to be doing the next year or the year after that. I was just grateful for the good parts about what we had, you know, um, and doing my best to fight the obstacles. Um, I still feel like that. I, I, I definitely feel differently now in terms of my relationship with my career. I know that I'm where I'm supposed to be. Um, and it's a wonderful thing to feel rather than just, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's, I'm having fun and people seem to like it. So hopefully, you know, this, this lasts a while. There's a different feeling when you've been doing it for um, 18 years. And, you know, it's like, this is a good thing in my life. I can look at my life and see all the joy that has brought me and brought others. It's been such a life-giving thing to have this. I have had to fight for it against a lot of different entities across the span of time. But it has all been worth it to be here in this moment and to be with um, my band, who I really, truly love, um, making music that I feel is such a true and real representation of who we are. It's bigger than myself. I couldn't do it by myself. I love it so much. I'm so grateful for all of it. And our fans, we have millions of fans all around the world who have stuck with us and, and cared and just supported us in such a beautiful way way it really feels like a, just a a world there's a whole world a whole community of stuff um that is a product of all of that and i am i have not in every moment in my life like loved it and wanted to rush back to it there have been plenty of times where i wanted to run away and wondered if we were ever going to do anything again but coming where we are now where we've gotten to and the whole full circle vibe of it all i just i really want to make use of time right now I don't want to waste a minute. I am so, so grateful um, and just really looking forward to going back on tour and feeling that feeling, that incredible thing that's like nothing else to stand on stage and be completely immersed in the music with a whole bunch of people that you don't even know, like in the crowd, just souls experiencing something that is deeper than language all together at the same time. So just talking about that, that, that journey and getting to this point, you know, you know, obviously you put out The Bitter Truth. And when I was listening to The Bitter Truth, I can hear what you're talking about, how it is a little bit more complex musically. There's a greater depth of sound there. Um, 
you know, that's obviously maturing, maturing as a songwriter, maturing as an artist, maturing as a, as a musician. How did making a record like that differ from something like Fallen or like, obviously, you know, there's many albums in between that too. Like how did, how did you know, and this is also, I think your first album of new music in, in maybe 10, 10 years. So. It is. How, yeah. How did you take all of this that you, you know, this coming up to this point, what, how did that go into the bitter truth? A lot of it is perspective and experience, and a lot of it is the situation that we're in on a business level. We are surrounded by people that fully support us and care and are fans of the band, and that's not the way it's always been. Um, and also, like, I'm not, this is actually the very first album really thinking about it, besides like Synthesis or something. Um, this is the first full original album where I haven't had to like show some label man the songs and get his approval that we could go ahead. Like, I don't have to do that anymore. We make the music that we want to make and we know when it's not good enough and we know when it is <laughs> and we know who we are um, and we just make our music. It leaves so much more room for creativity and positivity, you know, just to push each other and to be pushed by an incredible producer, Nick Raskulinix. He produced our last full album, um, the self-titled one. And we had such an incredible experience with him then too. I want to work with people that challenge me. I don't want to work with corporate businessmen who want me to dumb things down because they think that our audience is stupider than they are. Um, I want to make great music that I love and stand completely behind, which we really always had, but I used to have to fight for it. Um, this time there wasn't that fight. So there was just more energy to pour into the creativity. Where do you draw inspiration from these days for your songs? It's coming from a, mainly just an internal place just my own heart and perception and, and reactions to the events of my life, but also to the outside world. And there's been a lot going on the last couple of years. Um, so much to talk about. And especially since it has been 10 years since our last album, there's been a lot of events in my own life and in our band family um, to go to. For me, honestly, the, the greatest music for me, really, I don't know if I could say the greatest. Music pours out of me when there's challenge, when there's pain, when there's been something that I need to get off my chest. Um, so we've had some of that <laughs> in the, not just the last decade, but even looking back farther than that, um, this album is about now, but it's, it's also really about my whole journey, which just feels really good to hash out. Really good. It's also something that you have to be just looking forward to doing on stage and, and getting that same catharsis on stage. Uh, that you're, you know, you're getting these emotions out in the music, but it's going to be a different thing. So, what, what are you looking forward to most about this this hailstorm tour that you have coming up too? This I'm tour? so excited on so many levels about it. It's funny that we were just talking about touring with friends and everybody hanging out together. That's exactly what this is going to be. Last time we toured with hailstorm was um, 2012, mm -hmm. um, and that was another tour where everybody was friends, all the crew, both bands, just having fun cornhole competitions and hanging out, listening to music too loud after the show. Um, I hope that it can be that way. It was, it was like that before. And we love all those guys. Like it's, it definitely makes a difference just having fun with the, the people that you're with. And we, we have a lot of fun with them, but I'm looking forward to that element, the hangout element, knowing everybody that's super awesome. But um, also just, just being able to reconnect with fans and to go on stage and have all this new music after so long. Like we've been, we have a big enough catalog without it that we're able to kind of change up our set to a degree like before when we have been touring quite a bit over the past six years before pandemic stuff. Um, but now there's so much new music that we want to play. I feel like there's going to be a little bit of a challenge with the set, like about choices, because you got to throw some of the, you know, the familiar territory back in. You got to play Bring Me to Life. We got to put it sprinkle in some hits. But we're just dying to play the whole new record so bad. I don't think this is the right tour for it, but at some point I want to just like do a show that's just the full album start to finish. There's obviously a lot that you're hopeful for. You have this tour coming up, you have a new record out, uh, but what, what else is giving you hope for the rest of this year? Oh, my son just brings me a lot of happiness. Truly is the greatest thing I've ever been a part of, of creating in the world. I'm excited to go back on the road. He's excited to go back on the road. Um, it's going to be trickier now than it used to be because, you know, he'll be a first grader. So we'll have to kind of juggle like when he can come and, and when it's better for him not to. And that's going to be hard. Um, but when he can, he asks about it all the time. Like we've been working on this live stream 
and uh, practicing and stuff. So he sees, you know, glimpses of us doing our thing. And he's like, when do we go on tour? Because every time we've gotten together to do a rehearsal like this, it's always followed by cool. Then you get on the bus and this time not happening. So that's actually really depressing. <laughs> but he is at, he gets that and he's like, so when can we go on the bus? And I'm like, yeah, not yet. But we are going this November and you're coming for at least some of it. Like such an adventure to do that and to be able to show it with your child and, and give it to somebody for the first time is so much fun because you it makes you remember all the things that made you fall in love with doing what you do. Um, the light show, you know, I his eyes are just huge watching the crazy projections and light show just like and the music and the fans. And then also like he's a kid, so he gets up real early before me um, and our crew loves him and take him and let him, you know, help like hang, you know, fly the PAs and like ride on the little golf cart and like see what's going on backstage and understand what putting a show together is. Even making our music videos, we just did our Better Without You video and there's special effects. Like it looks like all the columns come down, but we really only crushed a small column. He instantly was like, how did you do that? How did you make that? Did you actually break that building? And I was like, well, let me show you. So I get to show him how special effects work. And he's really, really interested in what makes stuff work. And it's just exciting to him. That makes me excited. I'm excited to share it with him. And, and I don't know, just like have him be exposed to that really cool thing that we get to do. It's been an absolute pleasure for me. That tour was a big moment for me. You know, it was, it was, you know, for me, it was so much fun. Yeah. Um, I remember some of the very cool venues that you played, seeing you at Red Rocks, going to Red Rocks. I grew up in Colorado. So it was the first time we had a lot of first times on that. And that was really, really cool. That Red Rocks was great. And then there were scary venues like Harpo's in Detroit. That... <laughs> yeah, um, I remember that too. <laughs> It was cool. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're still doing it. I'm glad that the first tour just opened up so much for you. So thank you so much. It's great to reconnect with you and talk about that.